Well, the title of tonight's exhortation is, How Are You Answering God's Call? And because I don't have a lot of original thoughts on my own, I just want to credit commentator Matthew Henry and uh, theologian Charles Chuck Swindoll. To give you an outline of this exhortation tonight, first we're going to look at how Moses rejected God's call. Then we're going to look at how God's response to Moses' excuses. And then finally, the application, how do we respond to God's call on our lives? And that's the overall question I want you to keep always asking yourself as we, as we go through this text. How's God calling me and how am I responding to that? Well, we're going to look at Exodus 3 and 4. You might say, wow, Terry, how long are we going to be here tonight? But um, if you can turn to, your, uh, in your pew Bible, it's, it's page 90. Exodus 3 is on page 90. And we'll also see it up on the screen. Um, I'm just going to paraphrase the, the first uh, few verses. Um, this is the familiar story of Moses and the burning bush. Uh, you recall he, the bush burned, but, or bush, there was a fire, but, but it just didn't burn up. And God called Moses. Moses said, here am I. And then God laid out his plan, uh, seeing his, the Israelites in trouble. So I want to I pick up the reading on verse 9. And this is God speaking here. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So here's God's call. So he says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses, verse 11 here, this is objection number one. So if you have your own Bibles, can you put a little circle around that and maybe write objection number one? Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Verse 13, objection number two. Put a circle around that, right at number two. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you should call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward his people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman will ask her neighbor and every woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold for clothing from which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Chapter 4, verse 1, objection number 3. Write a, write a, write a note, write a 3 there. 
Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned, turned it back, turned the, the staff in his hand. Then, uh, then said the Lord, uh, it is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak and when he took it out, the skin went was leprous, it had become white as snow, and I'll put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put, the hand, uh, put his hand back into the cloak. When he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they don't believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile, throw it on the ground, and it'll become as blood. Verse 10, objection number four. Write a four there. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Verse 13, objection number five. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take his staff and but take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the signs with it. The word of the Lord. Keep your Bibles open. We've 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 gone through five objections that Moses raised. But if you could just turn forward a couple more pages, a couple more chapters. In chapter 6, verse 12, we read, But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites do not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? That was objection number 6. And then 18 verses later, we get objection number 7. Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Seven objections. Let's review the life of Moses. Exodus 2, he's born during the command of the king of Egypt to kill all the Hebrew boys. After Moses' birth, his mother hid him in a papyrus basket along the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter found him, and Moses became her adopted son. He lived in the palace, educated in all the best schools, experienced all the earthly benefits of royalty. Do you sense that God is preparing Moses? So at age 40, he sees his fellow Hebrews being taken advantage of, and Moses kills an Egyptian. A few days later, he finds out that he needs to flee Egypt and return to his homeland. So the next 40 years, he works as a shepherd, tending his father-in-law's sheep. What a demotion compared to living in Pharaoh's palace. God's hand was in preparing Moses during his formative first 40 years, followed by making Moses humble in his next 40 years, up to age 80. So this calling that we're looking at tonight occurred when he was 80 years old. Can we have a show of hands of folks that are over 80? I see a couple here, okay. 
Often when God chooses to call us, our initial response is to resist. Resistance comes from the belief that we know the situation better than what God does. We're happy to have God take care of situations for us. We just don't want to be his primary instrument. Why? Because we think we know better than he does what's required for the job. Pay close attention. The next 10 years of your life may be the best years ahead of you. But maybe you've already begun to talk yourself out of what God has planned for you. Like Moses, have you mounted a calculated resistance against God's clearly stated will for you or your family? So often God chooses us to do something great, and our initial response is to resist, to push back against his plan to doubt our readiness or our qualifications. Moses was no exception. He responded with five common excuses resisting God's clear call. The first excuse is, I don't have all the answers. Moses feared he wouldn't be able to answer the inevitable questions that would come from his fellow Israelites. Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, they'll say, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? We read about this in Exodus 3.13. The first common excuse for resisting God's call is that we don't have all the answers. Moses protested God's plans by saying, they're going to ask me things I don't know. I'm dealing with issues way above my pay grade. Remember, I've been talking to sheep for these last 40 years. Human nature tries to convince us that unless we have all the answers, we simply can't be in God's plan for us. At this point, Moses considered himself the most important factor in the equation. It was all about him. That's the core of such resistance. When you are still important to you, you fear losing face. You're afraid of hurting your reputation. You're afraid of what people will say or think. You're afraid of being ridiculed. You fear your family's response to what God is choosing you to do. What will your peers think? Yet God is undeterred by such fearful responses. His reply to Moses explains why. Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me, they'll ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Then God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people, I am has sent me to you. It's found in verses 13 and 14. Isn't that a great answer? I am? That'll cover most of the questions. Moses needed to understand that God's call had nothing to do with him and everything to do with God. The only answer he needed was God himself. Speak his name and all the answers will fall in place. When God chooses you to do something great, your response should not be about you, I can't, but rather about him, I am. Such an approach provides courage and confidence like nothing else. But Moses wasn't through resisting with his excuses. Here's the second excuse he tried to use to resist God's plan. I don't have all their respect. Even after... God's clear explanation of who was sending him, the reluctant old shepherd persisted with his resistance. He feared that he would not have the respect of God's people. Moses' response reveals his profound sense of inadequacy. Moses protested again, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? We read about this in Exodus 4, verse 1. You'd think that Moses would have been convinced by now. But don't forget, he's 80 years old. No doubt he was fairly set in his ways. In fact, his response is filled with classic what-if statements. Those are what I call worry words. Fear does that. It clouds our perspective and causes us to think about the worst-case scenario. What was Moses worried about? 
He was worried about himself, and he was worried about how the Israelites would view him. That's a self-image problem. Fear keeps the focus on ourselves rather than on the Lord. It emphasizes our inadequacies and minimizes God's power. It's no wonder that God responded with multiple demonstrations of his power. The Lord asked him, what is in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it on the ground, the Lord told him. Moses threw it on the, uh, on the ground. It became a snake. Moses jumped back. The Lord said, reach out and grab its tail. Moses did that, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff. Perform this sign, the Lord told him, and then they will believe the Lord, the God of their ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has really appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your jacket, put his hand inside his cloak, and he took it out again. It became leprous, uh, white as snow. Now put your hand back in, and it was clear, as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if you do not believe, and you are not convinced by this first miraculous sign, they'll be convinced by the second. And if they don't believe you or listen to you after these two signs, take some water and from the Nile River, throw it on the ground, and it will become like blood. It's found in Exodus 4, 2 through 9. Why did God go through this elaborate demonstration? To convince Moses that he'd have everything he needed when it was asked of him. The Lord's answer was, just go, Moses. Take your staff, stand back, and watch me work. Don't worry. You will have all my power. God speaks that same truth to you too, especially when he chooses you to do something great. He not only provides a clear path, he provides unlimited power to accomplish what he asks. Surprisingly, Moses followed up with yet another objection. This is excuse number three. I don't have all the ability. Still unconvinced, Moses raised another concern with the Lord's pleading, Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. I'm not now. And even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Exodus 4, verse 10. Moses used a classic response tactic. I don't have all the ability. It's speculated that Moses stuttered, a relatively common, a relatively common occurrence, and he'd grown very self-conscious about it. That speech issue became a stumbling block in his mind when he was considering God's plan, which primarily entailed public speaking. Notice God's response. The Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see, is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you on what to say. Exodus 4, 11 and 12. So God's reply completely dismantled the foundation of Moses' fear. God said, I made you that way. God reminded Moses that he was the one who had ordained everything about Moses, even his apparent disabilities, leaving Moses without excuse. But so many people struggle in this area, questioning God's design for their life, thinking, oh, I'm not, a, I'm not attractive. I'm too short. I'm not that bright. I struggle with depression. I have a fear of speaking in public. Well, who doesn't? And I, 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 making all these excuses. Well, all such objections lose their power in the face of God's sovereign design for our lives. He's made us so that he can be powerful in and through us. Remember the words of Psalm 139, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God said to Moses, I will be with you as you speak. I will instruct you on what to say isn't that a magnificent promise for Moses and for us? Now, Moses was running out of excuses, yet somehow he found a way to present two final objections. Number four, I'm not as qualified as others. It's Exodus 4, verse 10. And number five, I just don't want to do it. Exodus 4, 13. Moses' final response invoke God's anger. 
Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you. He will be delighted to see you, talk to him, and put the words in his mouth. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you both on what to do. We read about this in Exodus 4, 13 through 15. The Lord doesn't need anything special from you or me certainly doesn't need our counsel when he sovereignly chooses you to do something great. He doesn't need your advice on how to do it. Moses failed to grasp that truth, and often we do too. We get so caught up in our own excuses that we miss the entire point of God's call. He wants us to accomplish something great by doing something great in us. Often, part of God's response is choosing us to grow our faith and to deepen our trust in his power. Moses' response isn't so much humble as it is disobedient. It demonstrates a gross lack of faith. When you know for sure that God is speaking to you and you don't take him at his word, you're crossing a line. That's not humility, that's disobedience. In fact, it borders on defiance. The only appropriate response to God's call is obedience. That's the lesson that Moses needed to learn. So let's switch our focus now to God's response to Moses' excuses. God seems to be long-suffering, to put up with the excuses of Moses. God tries to reason with Moses first. God says, I'll be with you. Second, God says, God gives Moses a couple of miracles to keep in his back pocket. Thirdly, God provides logical arguments. Who made man's mouth? I'll help you speak. And then fourthly, God gets upset. God's anger burned against Moses. All right then, God says, in addition to calling you, I'm calling your brother Aaron. Notice how God doesn't give up on a reluctant Moses. Isn't it encouraging to know that when God's when, is it encouraging to know that when we resist God's call on us, God doesn't easily give up? God will give us the tools and the abilities to answer his call. So lastly, you know, what's the application? What do, what do we learn? What do, what do we do about this? How is God calling me? And what am I doing about it? This is a time to, to focus inward. I'll tell a personal story. Do I feel called to serve in the Wisconsin legislature? Well, I sure do. Every time I, I cross the threshold walking into the Capitol building, I say a brief prayer asking God to use me as a witness for him that day. Did I feel called to be in banking over 30 years? Oh, well, I sure did. When we talk about and think about callings, we often think about calling into the full-time gospel ministry or calling to be a missionary or a school teacher. But what about these types of callings? The call to be a stay-at-home parent and to sacrifice career and family income. What about the call to be a Sunday school teacher or a friendship club teacher or an ESL advisor? What about the call to be an elder or deacon? For those of us that have been financially blessed, what about the call to cheerfully give up of our assets for the kingdom of God? Are we ever too young to be called by God? As a student, how is God calling you to work for the best of your ability? Are we ever too old to be called by God? It seems when we get older, we're blessed with the gift of hospitality. For you, that may be baking cookies, and deliberately seeking out a person or a family with a need. In retirement, we can't spend all our time golfing or playing pickleball. Has God called you to be a prayer partner? It may seem that we've been hard on Moses in this exhortation, but God used Moses in a powerful way. Moses was one of the most prolific writers in the Bible, having authored the first five books of the Bible. Starting in Exodus 3, he was 80 years old. 
The rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy covered the life of Moses uh, from 80 to up to 120. At the end of Deuteronomy, we read Moses' obituary in Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, where it says, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Wouldn't that be great, said of us, our strength not be gone? Moses was among the heroes of faith listed in Hebrews 11. Verse 23, we read, By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 24, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not destroy the firstborn of Israel. The story of Moses foreshadows the story of Jesus Christ. So may we look for ways that God is calling us. Maybe we be ready and willing to accept those calls and may God bless our efforts to serve in his kingdom. Amen.